Blomcast. Turning Points in History. Wendepunkte in der Geschichte. Welcome to the Blomcast, the podcast that looks at turning points in history. And today we've got the biggest of them all, the daddy of turning points. We've got not only climate change, but what it will do to our cities, to our populations, to ourselves and to the way we will live in future. And to discuss all that in one little hour, I'm proud and happy to welcome Gaia Vince, um, one of the English-speaking world's foremost science journalists who's been an editor at Nature magazine, has won many important awards and has published, among others, Adventures in the Anthropocene, a book about the new age that we're living in and the book that we will focus on today, The Nomadic Century. Gaia, welcome. Hi, it's lovely to, lovely to be on this with you. Gaia, I myself do quite a lot of work on the climate crisis, on what it will do to our democracies, on how it will pressure our economic life, our civic life. But you go further, you go much further. Um, just to sort of lay the groundwork of what we will be talking about, can you take us into the world in 30 or 50 years? Yeah, so, so my book, Nomad Century, looks at how the planet is heating up. And what that really means is that we're going to see much more energy in the climate system, and that will drive much more extreme conditions. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, we'll be able to adapt to them. But to a large extent, we will not, because we're talking about coastlines um, disappearing and eroding. We're talking about increased um, flooding, drought, terrible heat, fires, um, and really an increasingly unlivable situation, um, particularly around the kind of middle band of our planet, where um, the majority of the world's population currently lives. That, that encompasses China, that encompasses India, that encompasses sub-Saharan Africa, Yeah, and a large part of Southern Europe as well. And we're already seeing, and, and the Americas, of course, um, as well. We're already seeing those conditions right now. We're seeing um, temperatures. I was just looking this morning. The temperatures are in um, the mid-40s um, in Spain at the moment. Uh, and the problem is also that they're not dipping below that Uh, below uh, livable kind of conditions at night and that puts huge amounts of stress on on the body so you know we're talking about deaths but also you know the loss of agricultural harvests which push food prices beyond um, affordability for large populations the, the grain belt where most of the world's grain is grown is moving away from the equator at a rate of about 20 kilometers a year is that right Yeah, so we're seeing this migration is already um, underway. It's already inevitable. And it affects, obviously, people. W what we see at the moment, um, and we have been seeing for the last decade, really, is um, the movements of, well, we see it in um, animals um, and in plants. We see the, uh, you know, new species of fish, um, flying insects, birds, um, even the tree line that um, is, no, we're seeing the greening of the Arctic, but it's also affecting the human world. So we're seeing um, human migration, but also the migration of capital, of resources, of um, investments, um, expertise, and of course, agriculture as well. So um, the major crop harvests, um, but vegetables as well. Um, and, you know, it's not, you know, a nice, steady, incremental move that we can adapt to. It comes in jolts and starts and it um, affects different populations in different ways. I mean, if you look at uh, my country in Britain, we've we've had uh, terrible flooding all year. That's again is caused by um, uh, increased temperatures and that's massively affected our harvests here, which, of course, because we're a relatively wealthy country, we will then be buying more food from overseas and that puts more pressure on places where they can't afford the food so it's you know we do live in a globalized world and all of these different um, extreme conditions in different parts of the world 
all put pressure on the most vulnerable, the poorest, uh, the most marginalised groups in our unequal society. And they largely live in the worst hit places. They largely live in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in, uh, in the tropical belt of our planet. Nomad Century deals with migration. It deals with the fact that a lot of us, a lot of the world population will have to become mobile. We are at the receiving end of a tiny um, amount of world migration at the moment in Europe. And already this tiny in the single percentage points um, amount of migration is creating huge political waves in Europe. Um, in all countries that are concerned, it's, there are mainly symbolic numbers. I mean, I think in Britain, People who came on boats, there were about 30,000 last year, which is quite a lot of people. But in the same year, I think 1.3 million people got a work visa in Britain who also came from outside of Europe. So, you know, yes, there is migration, but it's not always where you're looking. But um, how do you think that is conceivable that the rich world peacefully accepts people who have to move, who simply have to move. And how do you think we can think of building new societies, very different societies? You know, human mobility is completely normal. It's been taking place uh, ever since the birth of our species. You know, is we are um, an African ape, essentially, um, and we are now dispersed across the globe. And we did that through migrations. We did it through uh, the networks that we form. Um, that allow us, that these cooperative, collaborative networks that allow us to move to new places. And that's, that's a process that has been going on, um, you know, globally for hundreds of thousands of years. Indeed, we moved out of Africa for a start. Well, exactly. Um, we're now all over the whole world. We're in every continent. We're even in outer space, you know, in the ISS, permanent, um, permanent home, uh, extraterrestrial home. Now, what we're seeing as of very recent decades um, is unusual, this kind of this idea of closing borders. You know, borders themselves are quite new. Um, they, they have moved around and they've normally in through historical uh, times have been about a leader, whether that's a religious leader or a um, uh, you know, king, queen, emperor, whatever, uh, exerting their boundary of control, their territory of control. And it's been a transactional thing, which the, the majority of people have just been, you know, party to without any of their control. You know, the, most of this is very pre-democracy. Um, and borders were really about trying to keep people in not not um, stopping new people from coming in. It was stopping people from leaving. Um, in, indeed, there was, you know, the, the, the rulers wanted as many people as they could because of the economic advantages. They needed uh, labor for, um, for agriculture, for industry, um, for the military. This is a really interesting point. Sorry to butt in, but I'm an historian. So, you know, that fascinates me. Um, in the 16th, 17th century, you had... You had great com campaigns in Europe of getting people in. Yeah, and it wasn't always peaceful. People were, you know, there, there were lots of um, there were lots of uh, ways of persuading people to come in, but there are also lots of campaigns to basically kidnap people and bring them in. Whether through, you know, we had, there was slavery, of course, but also um, many other sort of military campaigns which weren't really about territory; they were about um, the human population, about getting them in because. Um, because it's it's well known by economists that uh, larger, denser populations are more productive. So if you want to grow your economy or even maintain living standards, you have to increase that population. And at the moment, around the world, but particularly in northern European countries, in the developed countries of, um, you know, from Japan to Korea to the United States, the only way that populations are being maintained, most of them are falling, 
is through immigration. It's the only proven way. There have been many um, domestic campaigns to get people to have more children. Uh, they have ultimately failed. The only way to get more people in has been through immigration, and leaders know that. But unfortunately, what's happened in the last few decades has been this populist-led, nationalist, sometimes ethno-nationalist campaigns by um, largely right-wing leaders to to convey this narrative that we need fewer immigrants, we need less immigration. Immigration is somehow bad. It's not, um, it's not good for the economy. It's not good for jobs. It's not good for anything. And that's the answer. And instead of challenging this with a pragmatic and honest narrative, we find over particularly the last decade, centrist, left-wing um, parties have gone along with this. They haven't challenged it. It's been an absolute abdication of responsibility and it's completely non-pragmatic. And so the, the dominant narrative is that immigration is a problem. It's bad and it's a problem. And then so so what we've had from different parties is is this kind of different ways of managing this problem and stopping immigration rather than, you know, an, an actual uh, debate around you know, immigration itself not being bad, but being good. And, you know, how do we make the most of this opportunity, this economic opportunity? But also, how do we make sure that, um, you know, in different parts of countries, of nations, of regions, we, um, we manage the numbers so that they're not a shock. And so we also manage the investment in those areas, because it does require at least short term investment in order to make it succeed. And, you know, this is this is actually the big problem um, that we've experienced. But it is abnormal in historic terms, very abnormal. This uh, and, you know, it's my belief that it will have to change because, first of all, immigration is and always has been underway. It is inevitable. Second, it is going to go up largely because of climate um, change and the fact that these climatic conditions um, have become um, a driver of other issues, conflict, um, breakdown in diplomatic relations, um, trade problems, all sorts of other things which drive more people. Um, and partly because, you know, we have this declining workforce. So whether, you know, even the most xenophobic leader, while saying we're building walls, we're stopping boats, we're sending people back, with the other hand, is trying to get more people in because, you know, we need them. We have labour shortages in every sector. Let me make this a little bit more complicated. Um, so in the 17th century, you needed more people because basically the only source of energy, the only source of work was muscle energy animals and people and a little bit of wind and water for mills and stuff but um, otherwise that was the energy there was then came the industrial revolution that loosened that link between population density and work because you had machine work and now we're in a very curious point in western societies and we also have to look at this pragmatically um, on the one hand we are having too few babies we are having a too small, a small, too slender generation to carry on the care of the elderly, um, the payment of that, um, the, the size of the economy. On the other hand, we have massive automatization, um, which we're constantly being told is going to rob us of hundreds of thousands of jobs. Um, how does that work with maintaining societies as we have them or do we simply have to say goodbye to them um well i would rather not say goodbye to society because i think that's the foundation of um certainly human civilization but also the way that we collaborate as a species we are a species that works in societies um so first of all yes when we um industrialized we um moved some labor from one area into another. But we didn't lose jobs at all. We, in fact, required more jobs. And we globalized a lot of that, you know. Um, industrialization was a huge, you know, uh, source of jobs. 
Um, but they moved from local agricultural fields to cities generally. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the agricultural labor force came from overseas, whether we're talking about the slave plantations in cotton and sugar um, overseas, or whether we're talking about extractive industries such as mining, uh, which again was a huge, huge source of labor. We are undergoing another energy transition right now um, from fossil fuels, which is extractive, to um, uh, to clean energy, which is not extractive, but also requires huge amounts of labor in that transition, whether it's somebody who can um, exchange your gas boiler for a heat pump or fit solar panels to your roof or, you know, so so it is, again, a source of labor or whether it's people working in factories to produce the solar panels and other related devices. Um, in terms of AI, again, we will see another and we are seeing another layer of autom automation in, in but that has no effect at all, re very little effect um, on caring roles on that huge, huge sector and growing sector um, that we have because of the, the aging population. So people are living older and longer with much more complex um, needs. Uh, and, and, you know, some of that can be handled through, um, through robots and automation, hopefully the heavy lifting, the labor aspect but not the caring roles. Um, and there are also many other new industries that require, um, that require human labor, whether it's uh, nature restoration, which is going to be a huge economy um, over the coming decades, um, or, or whether it's um, you know, the biotech, nanotech um, industries, which are just, we're just at the very beginnings of. You know, labor, it will change, but people will still be needed. I don't see, I don't see AI taking, I mean, it takes some sorts of jobs, but we've already seen what it can and what it can't do quite, quite well. Um, and it has its uses as a tool, just as uh, the industrial tools uh, that we had, you know, over the last couple of centuries have changed the nature of work and they've, uh, and jobs have been lost, but other jobs have being created and hopefully jobs that are less damaging to human bodies. I mean, if you think about the life of a coal miner or you think about the life of, um, you know, a hard labourer agricultural worker, um, it was hard and brutal. <laughs> it sometimes seems to me, actually it all the time seems to me, that we are living in societies that have given up on the future where the best political promise you can make to an electorate is that nothing will have to change. You can keep everything you have now, you can keep your lifestyle, your consumption patterns, you won't have to change, we'll find another answer somehow. And that is already reassuring enough for people not asking which answer and how, because um, that would also perhaps invite, uh, invite some unwelcome questions. Now, you take us a few steps further and you do something quite extraordinary um, because you don't only show us a very stark scenario of how this, the mechanics of climate change will work, how many people will have to leave the places where they're living, etc. But you actually make this into a hopeful scenario. You actually say we can imagine better societies through that. Now, that is quite a feat. Well, you know, I don't think things are so great now. I really don't. You know, we have polluted air, polluted water. We have gross inequality. We have a lot. We have poverty globally, but also within our own societies. You know, people are using food banks in very wealthy societies. We have billionaires, an increasing number of billionaires, which is, to me, quite obscene when we have... Britain is great in that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's horrendous. And, and this is a symptom of, you know, governance not working, poor governance. It's, um, you know, if we want functional societies, um, we, we have to we have to have better regulation of how our economic markets work. And if they've been allowed to grow, you know, if they've been allowed to 
grow in for for a very small handful of people at the expense of an enormous number, then that is a sign of a sick um, system. It's not rocket science, you know, how we <laughs> fix that economic system. Uh, we can see quite clearly countries that have got it much better, that, that are much more equal. Such as? Well, the Scandinavian countries famously have much more transparency over um, over their finances, over um, over their earnings and taxation. And they have societies where the public transport is of high quality and works, where they where schooling is of a good standard, where healthcare is of a good standard, and where if you're poor, you are you know, you are just as likely to receive prompt, efficient and good quality cancer care as if you are rich which is how it should be in a wealthy society. And we are failing on the basis of that in countries like the United States, for example. Just for complications sake again, Denmark has turned hard to the right and even the social democrats have reduced migration drastically. Sweden is in a real crisis and that is to do with gang violence. That has a lot to do with migration. Um, I'm just wanting us not to be too easily optimistic. I'm talking about the um, the economy, not not about migration at the moment. So, um, so, so you started off by saying people want no change, and that's a that's a general feeling. People don't like change; they are afraid of something new and something different. But change happens anyway because it's part of life. The opposite to change is stasis, is death. Um, your home city in the 1940s, 1950s is very different from what it is now and will be very different from what it is in the 2060s, 2080s. But if you were to talk to people in the, in the 1950s and say, you know, it's all going to change, it's going to be dramatically different, you know, it's going to look like this, people would be scared, they would be horrified of all the change and yet actually standard of living has generally risen in that time um, and is generally better. And I see a lot of problems now. I don't see this um, incredibly wonderful society that cannot be improved, this incredible world that's so perfect that we cannot improve it. I see lots and lots of ways that we can make it better. Now, in terms of immigration, it hasn't been handled very well. Large scale immigration hasn't been handled very well in, in many countries. Um, it is, it, it requires investment initially. So it requires two key types of investment, and that is financial investment, but also social investment. And yes, Denmark and Sweden have been very good at the financial investment. They have accepted migrants, but they haven't done that very important inclusivity that has to be taken, that has to take place. They've gone from relatively um, homogenized societies to, um, to societies where people live in two silos. They are not, they, you don't, you know, Britain is not perfect, but I would say that London, for example, is an, ex an example of a society of, uh, that is very ethnically mixed but they've managed to achieve that. Obviously, in the past, there's been a lot of problems, but that inclusivity has been achieved a lot better in London than in, in many other places. And I think that as we go, as we take the next step to mass immigration, we have to learn from places that have got it right. And, and that social inclusion is, is key as well as the financial investment. So the financial investment is really important in terms of ensuring there is enough housing, there is enough access to healthcare, um, infrastructure, that um, thought has gone into where investment in new industry and, uh, and you know, academic tuition and training and all of that goes um, in to ensure that there isn't competition over things like housing with the existing community and the immigrants. But that other investment in terms of inclusivity, it's, it's an investment in the society that already exists in terms of 
ensuring that how they see themselves and how they see citizenship and how they see their cities is different and includes people that don't look the same, that have different color skin, that have different um, faiths, that have different clothes, food types, all of that, but is a much more inclusive idea of what it means to be um, someone from Stockholm or Copenhagen or, or London. And that key thing has been missing. I mean, in, so in Britain, we had race riots, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but I do think that a lot of learning has come from that. And if you talk to a Londoner, they don't have this idea of a Londoner as being a particular colour or religion or, you know, they are very proud of this kind of um, of how great London is that it can attract people from all around the world, which is a much more. It, I mean, it's, it, it, I find it more appealing, but it's also pragmatically a much more practical way of understanding society because that is what cities have always been and always will be unless you put those damaging barriers in place. And, you know, cities will be competing over immigrants. A lot of um, towns and cities are dying around the world because they're depopulating so fast, you know, from Italy to East Germany to Russia, obviously. And you know, if we want to attract people, we have to have that inclusive narrative that they're not just here to work. They are part of forming the city of our future. And that also means a certain openness of that society to not only take their labor, but also take their views, take their way of living um, and grow a new kind of ethos together. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. You get this fusion of idea and it's not, it's not a, you don't lose anything. You don't lose your favorite foods or your favorite um, style of architecture or your favorite, I don't know, poetry or whatever. You don't lose that. That still exists as long as there are people that still appreciate it. But you gain other ways of looking at things, other types of food, other Uh, ceremonies and so on. And, and you then get this fusion as well. So you get the birth of something that is particular to that place, a culture that is very special because it could only have formed in that particular laboratory of influence. And that, to me, is the most beautiful flourishing of humanity. Let me just pursue a little bit this angle of, of psychological, the psychological aspects of it before we go to the scientific and social, which you are writing about so eloquently. Um, but this idea of no future, and you said our society doesn't seem so great to me now, but of course, you know, we know from psychology what, that whatever is familiar to you, even if it is bad, is where you feel at home. You know, even people who've been growing up with abuse, um, are often seeking to reproduce that uh, situation in their later lives because it's what they know, it's what they, what they in some degree have constructed their personality to live in. So I think this, this, this sort of situation of societal stasis here is also a kind of helplessness in the West because people can't imagine other futures. Exactly. And that, to me, is why we need good, strong leaders. And I don't mean strong in a sense of like Putin or uh, absolutely not. I mean strong in the sense that they have got a narrative that they can bring people along with, that they can describe and help people visualize a better way. And it's not about a rejection of everything that you hold dear, but it is about an honest appraisal of where things could be better. You know, it is not It's not healthy or helpful or nice to live in a society where um, the streets are completely clogged with traffic, where children are getting dying of asthma because of the air quality, you know, where um, like in America, only very poor black people use public transit. I mean, it's that's to me is a broken, sick society. There are much better ways of doing that. Um, but the role of leadership 
is to bring people along, is to open people's eyes and make them also part participants. Give them agency in the future that you create jointly together. And, you know, this, this idea of citizenship as being um, sort of almost a caretaker role in, your, in the nation that you will build together for, you know, your own older age, but your, the age of your children and grandchildren and so on, rather than just sitting there, keeping everything the same while it sort of dies and gets worse and you erode other parts. That's, you know, things have to be improved all the time. We are at a very interesting point here because I believe people don't learn from clever arguments. People learn from discordant experiences. Only when what they experience in their lives can no longer be explained by the model they have of the world, by the story they tell, tell themselves about themselves, are, are we all willing to entertain that the world might be different? Just a beautiful book or somebody talking very well won't make you reevaluate your life in all likelihood. But if you can no longer explain what happens to you, then you become more open to entertaining different points of view. Possibly, but I do think there is a huge role um, for artists, writers, filmmakers to to help with that process as well as as well as the personal experience i mean if you look at what happened in germany um you know last year and, and this year with the floods with people seeing their hometowns utterly transformed with people made homeless because uh, and, and and infrastructure roads disappearing and all of that 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 is a shock an absolute shock a visceral experience um and surely, but that ex that affects a, a small population compared to, you know, understanding the world differently through through film and art and books. You have written about that in a book called Transcendence, um, where you also talk about the importance of beauty. I've also written about that kind of thing, about the importance of art to open new windows of the mind, to put yourself of empathy, um, to become able to see in this to see this new world to see new worlds alternative realities different ways of doing things also i think that thinkers like bruno latour have been very important in making in getting us to make this leap but my question is really the climate crisis is now here we're all feeling it we're all experiencing it um, not as catastrophically as people around the equator or in particularly vulnerable areas, but even here, those floods, um, other um, disasters, already the climate crisis is a huge economic factor that's costing billions a year, etc., etc. Now, that may just be one of those discordant experiences that make people see the world differently, make them, enable them to see the world differently. But my question to you is really, when a moment like that comes, when one model simply no longer works and another one isn't yet there, there's a vacuum. And all sorts of voices come into this vacuum. I wrote a book um, called Nature's Mutiny, where I wrote about the Little Ice Age and where climate change changed societies, I think. And you see very clearly that at the moment when the old model, which was the religious model, something in the world doesn't work, you pray, or you, you um, become penitent because obviously you're being punished for your sins. When that no longer worked, all sorts of ideologies flooded um, to fill this vac vacuum and science eventually worn out, but alchemy and the Rosen Rosencrucianism, etc., and other models were also competing for that space. We will have a competition like that today again. We see that with people like Trump, and you know, which is also an answer to this unsettling time. Um, when all old answers no longer work. And this is doubling down on the old answers. That will work even less, but that is what you and I say. There's millions of people who believe something different. How dangerous, how risky a point is this when one model no longer works? And what can you do? What can we do to make 
ideas and models that are not enormously brutal and not and don't doom our societies to go further and further into this direction. Um, how can we make these other answers stronger? Yeah, I mean, it's true. We, we are in a poly crisis, I guess, at the moment with, with many. And, and we have, you know, we do have um, populist leaders with their nice, easy to repeat slogan solutions for everything. They're very quickly undone because obviously they don't provide answers. Um, and when they don't, they immediately then blame immigrants and blame. Uh, that, to me, is something that doesn't last very long. And we, we're already seeing a sort of retreat from populist leaders. We've seen, you know, we've seen various, um, various countries reject that. Um, if you look at, say, Bolsonaro, for example, um, the US did reject Trump. They went for Biden. And, you know, I'm still hopeful. Um, you know, Britain, for example, went through its Brexit populist phase and, and it is finally turned a corner now. It, it's bad. We don't have time for any of this nonsense. But to me, it's important not just... There are plenty of writers and artists who, who spell out the problems we're in and it is a very hopeless scenario and terrible. And that might persuade people, you know, to do something. But for me, that, that has never been what I want my work to be about. Um, I've always found my role is, is, is based in solutions, is finding answers, is showing is helping visualize a different world that is better, a better Anthropocene, a better answer to the problems that we have now, but all within reach, not, not fantastical. Um, and I think that has been what's driven me. Um, and and the, the other aspect to that, I think, is, is this idea that... Um, The future isn't made. We don't know exactly what it what it is, and it could go in various ways. And there isn't an absolution. There isn't a, you know, there isn't a cliff beyond which we sort of fall off and everything is terrible. These are choices that we continually make. Um, but it, we have to we have to be real about the fact that our world has changed already and is continuing to change. And so we can't we can't. Um, for me, it's, it's dishonest to believe in sort of naive hope that we can retain everything as it is now and, and we'll be somehow fine. And um, if we do this, it will, you know, uh, I don't know, if we reach net zero by 2030, we'll turn around climate change. That's not true, right? We're stuck with the world that we've made, which is very extreme and very, very dangerous. You know, we do have mechanisms, but they involve huge amounts of trade-offs. What, what are we willing to take? You know, these are, these are much more complex decisions and complex situations. Um, I think, I think that is, that is very, very important. So I think solution focus is very important. And the other thing is, you know, with Nomad Century, for instance, when I'm talking about immigration, um, there's a very obvious human moral case for why we should help people in need from other places. For me, we are part of one human species. But I don't really dwell on that because I think there isn't anyone alive that doesn't know that. But they make arguments against it in various ways because it's uncomfortable for them or involves sacrifice. And I don't believe actually, that in order to live in a sustainable way, you have to make huge sacrifices to your um, your standard of living or, or what you do. Or I don't think it's um, a case of we all have to go back to the Stone Age. I don't believe in degrowth and all of that. I, I think that's actually really harmful, especially for poor people. I think that what we need to do is decouple growth from environmental destruction and social destruction and we've already 
we've already started along that path. Most, um, a large number of economies have um, decoupled emissions from um, economic growth. But the point I'm making in my book is that there is a very strong economic argument. So it is better for you and it is better for your, ultimately for your environment, if we manage these in pragmatic, practical ways. That's the point I'm trying to make, rather than the moral argument, which I think, you know, has been made. I also think the moral argument is never particularly interesting. Um, Earth is not punishing us because we've been naughty. It is simply, it is simply that we are changing natural systems and there will then be different. And we have to adapt to different ways of living in them. It's a mechanical thing, not a moral thing. Well, I mean, I think there is a strong moral um, argument running through it, but I think, I don't think, you know, you know, making the world worse for people is bad. I think that is understood by everyone. And I feel like I, I didn't need to, that was not the argument of the book, but it is an argument of many, many environmental books. The whole thing is very much about that. And I think... If you're reading it and you get this very sort of punitive <laughs> sense from your author, it's a little bit off-putting um, and you don't want to feel like the baddie. <laughs> people, people with a solid Protestant background thrive on being thrashed by authors um, and being given a well, really bad Well, that's true because these books do sell very people, well. <laughs> people make careers about that. I, I was very struck by what you said about degrowth and decoupling. I mean, degrowth, first of all, I think it is so important to say, uh, especially in sort of climate conscious circles, because it's such a popular idea. Um, and at the same time, nobody has been able to explain to me how we can maintain social states, which cost a bomb, um, how we can maintain democracies, which also have very expensive institutions go along, going along with them, or indeed how we can withstand the attack of somebody like Putin um, when we are forced to spend stupid amounts of money on the most senseless thing of all, namely weapons. Um, so degrowth seems to me a step in the wrong direction. Uh, at the same time, and this is, I'm asking you as a science journalist, I always hear from people who know more about it than I do, that decoupling has not really worked yet anywhere. Oh, well, that's simply not true. If you look at um, energy and, and economy, um, that generally, we have uh, at least 20 of the wealthiest economies have already decoupled their economic growth from uh, emissions. And that includes offshore emissions, you know, what we import from China or, or wherever. Um, it's already underway. And, and that's been not a deliberate, you know, government setting out to do that, which would have been great. That's, that has been an accident, largely due to um, greater energy efficiencies and the exchange of very polluting industries for much less polluting industries. So, um, you know, it's... Once you are a developed economy, it's, you know, it, growth has been largely in more in the service sector. It, it's, an, it's a variety of different reasons, but it's already happening. But, you know, we need to go further and it's, it needs to be across, you know, that's, that's well understood. That's why we're doing this energy transition, right? Um, And we also need to, you know, clear up pollution in other ways and in, in particularly in the poorest countries into river systems and, you know, the deforestation that's rampant, all of those sorts of things that are driving economic growth in many countries. So, so it's not happening in many countries, but in an in increasing number, it is happening in the wealthiest countries. Uh, development is so, so important and, um, You know, how we measure economic growth. Also, I think there are no economists that, that, that support GDP as a measure of, this is, this is a fallacy, which is again always sort of touted. They, you know, there are much better ways of measuring it. You quickly remind people why GDP is such a completely stupid thing. Well, just because it measures, um, It measures extraction, basically, and it doesn't measure the sort of environmental cost of something. So, so if you measure economic growth as it 
actually is an, entailed, which is the um, growth in productivity and or quality um, of production, then, you know, things like a malaria vaccine is part of economic growth, right? But that wouldn't be measured in GDP, for example. On the other hand, building more prisons for more criminals is good for GDP, but not necessarily good for the society. No, exactly. So we need better, more nuanced measures of that. And there are many, many other models of measuring economic growth, which are much better and which are used in various different ways. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think there... I think it's quite naive to believe that economists think that economic growth is completely, it's all about GDP. It really, you know, people do not think that. And um, there are much, much better ways of growing economies, but they do need to grow. We have huge inequality. We have many, many people living in abject poverty uh, without access to basic, you know, electricity connections or clean water. Um, you know, it's a, it's a mistake. If we all lived in some sort of wonderland and we all had plenty of stuff, we could, you know, we could address these in different ways. But at the moment, this is, this is, uh, this is the best way of pulling people out of poverty and always has been. Speaking about um, morality, this is, I mean, you make, you make a strong case that this is also a moral case, that we all belong to the same species, that there's a degree of solidarity involved here. That on a planetary scale is at the moment vanishingly small. And to manage a migration movement of hundreds of millions of people, um, and it will be handy when the tundra in Russia thaws out and parts of Canada become inhabitable, because there are huge tracts of land that can still be inhabited. Um, but all that needs to be managed somehow. In other words, we need some sort of supranational agency, government, whatever you want to call it, to coordinate all of that. And yeah, but isn't this isn't this where the where the idea becomes really critical? Because we see at the moment nations or clusters of nations acting according to the most naked power interests and national interests and narrow interests we do see that and um and it's been growing and it's a, and it's um it doesn't work right because we are all connected our energy systems are all connected our food system we saw during the pandemic you know suddenly all the supply systems closed down because actually we are our economies are incredibly entwined but our food our telecommunication systems our internet everything is actually um You know, we can't afford in London for the economy of China to tank, right? That would absolutely defeat us. It's in all of our interests. Our interests are aligned in so many of these things. And these are global crises. They are planetary crises. And they, to a certain extent, there is a huge role for city mayors, for state leaders, for um, bilateral and regional um agreements and laws to to help this but ultimately you know carbon dioxide molecule produced in india or in uh, scotland it's all part of the same system um human movement again um when you when you look at on the micro scale of individual families sure that's a nation by nation thing but if you look at it from a planetary scale from a species level scale if you zoom out and see that movement, you know, um, it becomes to me very, very clear that this has to involve some sort of global agreement. I mean, you know, after the Second World War, when nations, you know, they, they hated each other, they'd been literally fighting to the death, and millions of people had died, there were millions of displaced migrants moving all over the world, entire cities had been reduced to rubble, all of that. There was this great international, you know, effort to produce these United Nations bodies, to, to try and make a better world, to produce a declaration of human rights, to, um, to produce a World Health Organization to eradicate, you know, diseases like smallpox and polio. And, you know, there was this international effort in this time of 
nations really hating each other. And right now, yes, we have appalling conflicts in various parts of the world, but we are relatively much, much more peaceful, partly be due to the inter you know, interconnected nature of our trade and monetary agreements than we have ever been. Um, and so this is an effort that I think needs to have some sort of uh, management from the top level and, and uh, organization. You know, we have the COP climate agreements. It's been very, very slow. But if you think we are, you know, 8 billion population of people living everywhere from sort of straw huts in the desert to, um, you know, high rise apartments in, <laughs> in cities. And yet, you know, we have a table where leaders from every nation is represented and they've come to an agreement that we are going to do something about an absolutely invisible gas that we can't even see, but which is produced at the very, very heart of all of our economies. We're going to try to take action to limit the production of that gas, you know, based on scientific models, which many, you know, don't have the training to understand, we've managed to come together and collaborate over that. To me, that's absolutely extraordinary. And, um, and I think we should be similarly ambitious for dealing with the consequences of the conditions that we, we are creating. We should be. Um, among historians, there's the smoking rubble theory that only when you stand in front of the smoking rubble of your previous life are you ready to entertain a new one. I very much hope that, um, that, that I mean, we are moving towards the smoking rubble, but let us hope that there indeed is a global stock taking. The last point that I want to pick you up on, because there... I'm, I'm quite a little bit perturbed, is are your ideas about geoengineering? I always think it seems a very foolish thing to, uh, to disturb an infinitely complex system with a very, very simple measure, such as, for instance, bringing particles into the atmosphere to deflect sunlight, because you do not know how the systems will react and what the reactions will be in two or three hundred years. Um, don't you think that's a risk too far? We do, because it's um, every time we have a volcanic reaction, we know how long these um, particles last in the atmosphere um, and what the consequences are. And, and this, this would be a very, very, very much smaller, a, a, you know, an absolute fraction of what is emitted during a volcanic eruption. But do you think that that is actually a plausible way forward? Um, Yes, I do. I mean, we, you know, we haven't done enough tests or any tests to see, you know, how or whether we would be able to deploy the uh, gases, but we know very well what effects they would have. Um, we are at the moment doing something very simple to a very complex system, which is just releasing carbon dioxide molecules and methane. I mean, it's a very, very simple thing, but it's having absolutely devastating system wide consequences um, because of the heat that's trapped. So if you can reduce that heat, it's very important. I mean, you know, wouldn't it be nice to not even have to think about this? <laughs> But, you know, the reality is that millions of people are dying today because of uh, the carbon dioxide we're emitting. And I think there will come a point where people will say, you know, after a particularly devastating heat wave, which you know, we have heat dome that's been over um, Asia four months now, you know, which is killing people, um, where they will say, enough, we need to do something about this. Um, and the problem with reducing emissions is that we've left it so late that it will have a very minor effect. It, it might, you know, well, it, you know, if we reduce them by enough, it will stop the temperature climbing as catastrophically as it is set to do over the, over the century, but it's not going to reduce the temperature back to livable conditions. For that, we either need to withdraw the CO2 or we need to block the sun's heat from, um, from impacting the CO2, from letting the CO2 do its greenhouse um, activities. Last question. 
none of us can look into the future. We know fairly well how natural systems will behave in the future, and we can make scenarios what will happen with 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, etc. We don't so much know so, know so well how human societies will react to that. There are many directions that can go into and no doubt will get, go into. Um, <clears throat> but give us a plausible best-case scenario of what kind of London your kids will be living in. Well, I can only say what I hope they will be living in. I, I, I find painting apocalyptic pictures is, you know... Beautifully alliterative, but otherwise... Yeah, I mean, it's, there, there are a lot of those. I think it's better to visualise what your best option is and then work out the steps to get there. So for me, it, it would be, um, yeah, a denser city with, uh, with more people from around the world living there. But I hope a stronger society, a stronger sense of community would come with that because I hope that planning would go into ensuring that there are social and community spaces and interactions and that crucial investment in making sure that people from all around the world, but also cross-generational young people and old people and um, as well as working age people are all um, included in that that sense of a community and that it's a much greener, uh, cleaner, quieter, healthier city where, you know, it will be heavily adapted to the, you know, much more extreme conditions that we're already experiencing, but that, you know, the buildings will be working. They won't just be passive users of electricity, but they will be generating their own energy. They will be recycling their own waste and water um, and, and, you know, heat energy into, into other places and that it's uh, a city of opportunity and hope because that's what we need as humans. Gaia, you've really given me um, the desire to live in that city. Thank you for being on the Blomkast and talking to me. It's been really wonderful and thank you for making the time. Well, thank you, Philip. It's been a real pleasure. I hope um, that we'll have another opportunity to, to speak. And if you enjoyed this conversation, then give it a like. Or even better, subscribe to it and tell your entire families, all your friends, and perhaps a few of your enemies about this wonderful podcast. We need to grow like everything else in the world. So thank you and thank you, Gaia Vince. Bye-bye.